Hi friends, welcome to the By Faith Podcast. I'm your host, Christine Hoover, and I am so glad to be back with you, kicking off a brand new season of By Faith, focused on serving by faith. Each week this season, I will talk with a guest about how they're using their unique gifts and talents in their specific context and season of life. How did they come to know their gifts? What challenges are they facing as they serve? And what are they learning that can help us where we are? These are the questions we'll answer this season, and I can't wait to share the conversations I've been having with you. My prayer for you is that you'll be encouraged, challenged, and equipped to step out by faith using your particular gifts for God's glory. Speaking of using their gifts, you may have noticed, if you've been around the podcast for a while, that I've got some brand new music going on. Thanks to my friend and songwriter, Paul Zock, for the new music. You'll definitely want to check out Paul's work. My very favorite song of his is Our Labor Is Not In Vain from the Porter's Gate album entitled Work Songs, which is a fabulous album that corresponds well with the topic for this season, Serving by Faith. Friends, I am so excited about my first guest this season. Her name is Missy Branch, and she works at Southeastern Baptist Theological Seminary as the Assistant Dean of Students to Women and the Director of Graduate Life, which she'll explain more about what she does in our conversation. Missy is married to William, and together they have four kids. Missy says the job she's in now found her, but before that she was at home with her kids, homeschooling them, serving in what she calls the obscure years. I wanted to know about those years, the obscure years, because whether or not we're married or single, mothering or not, homeschooling or not, most of our service happens in obscure, unseen ways. I asked her how she navigated those times when she felt uncertain and when she felt her gifts and passions were going untapped and how she cultivated contentment in where God has had her along the way. I know you're going to love Missy, and you'll find her as insightful as I did. So friends, here is my conversation with Missy Branch. Hi, Missy. Welcome to the podcast. Hi. Thank you so much, Christine. I'm glad to be here. I'm so glad you're here. I can't wait to hear from you and learn from you. I've gotten to know you just a little bit through other avenues and everything you say. I'm like, I want to... I want to know more about that. I want to talk to Missy more. So I'm excited to have you on to hear from you today. So can you introduce yourself before we get started? Yes. yes. My name is Missy Branch. I um, am Assistant Dean of Students and Director of Graduate Life at Southeastern Baptist Theological Seminary here in Wake Forest. I have a husband. We've been married 22 years. I always say, always, we got married when I was six. That's my story. <laughs> <laughs> Um, we have four kids and two of them are here in college as students at the College oh. of Southeastern. So yeah, we're all in, my husband is a professor here and uh, we have two younger ones, but yeah, we're all in here at Southeastern. How old are your younger ones? Uh, she just turned 17 this week and then I have a 13 year old. They range from 21 to 13. Okay. What, what does your husband teach at Southeastern? He is an adjunct professor. He teaches a New Testament survey. Okay. And how long have y'all been there? A while? Yeah, we've been here five years. He's working on his PhD. And so he's been kind of doing that and teaching. So it's been, it's been good. Yeah. yeah. He's been teaching right now in the college, but um, his goal is to be teaching in the seminary afterwards. Okay. So your title was long. You said yes. you're assistant. It's two things. Yes. Oh, two different um, jobs. Two different things. Yes. So I am both the director of graduate life and the assistant dean of students to women. Okay, so what does that mean? What do you do on a daily basis? <laughs> yes, a little <laughs> bit of everything. <laughs> um, well, both of my jobs, I have the opportunity to minister to both students and their families. And so I'm passionate about um, seeing women, but people in general, really being impacted with the gospel. So I always use this example, like what the things you're learning in class, how are they impacting you and changing your life? So you're less, um, I mean, so you have more integrity and you're less racist and you're more giving and you're, you know what I'm saying? Like you're learning all this head knowledge and how are you living that out? So in my roles, both roles, I get the opportunity to create content. I get the opportunity to create programming. I get the opportunity to throw events. I get the opportunity to disciple women, to counsel women, um, we work on discipline cases. So, I mean, my staff and I, we do a lot. <laughs> we do a lot. 
So is it really anything to do with women on campus? You have your hand in that? Yes. Okay. So I would imagine there's a lot of women in your office just, I got to talk to you, Missy, and you're yes. counseling them and helping them. It's a, honestly, I think that's the best part of my job. I spend a lot of hours doing that. A lot of women, I keep tissue in here. We do a lot. We have a lot of <laughs> tears shed and a lot of rejoicing, a lot of hugging. Um, so it's beautiful. It really is. But then we also, I have a great team of people that I work that work under me and they are really great at just, we cast a lot of vision. And so we try to create opportunities for women to be trained in discipleship and evangelism and mental, you know, just all these different things. Um, Bible studies, just different ways, creative ways though, Mm -hmm. to bring all the women from the different spheres on our campus, both faculty, student wives, PhD students, bring them all in and Mm -hmm. have them impacted. What were you doing before this job? Believe it or not, Christine, I was a stay-at-home mom for 16 years, and we I had done a million things and then during those 16 years, and then I was working at a flower shop, and I was a, I had my own business as a cake baker and cake decorator, so I would make crazy cakes, like wedding cakes, yes, but then also if somebody said, hey, can you make this cake look like a house or a hat or a shoe, I would do that too, <laughs> And I got those orders all the time. <laughs> you're you're yeah. a woman of many talents, apparently. It's crazy. It's I've done a lot of things. We um we planted a church a few years back, and I got the opportunity to lead women and children. And that's when I really got the bug. When I really got to get a taste of what it means to impact people in a way. As a mom, I felt it. I've got the opportunity to feel it. But in those opportunities, I really got to see. Man, I love just impacting people. I love when people are different, having spent time with me or us as a family. And so so anyway, any opportunity I can to impact people, I guess. (laughs) So are you saying that your husband is also a pastor? So my husband is a he was a pastor, yes, when we were at the church. We're, we moved away. We're out of that city now. Oh, okay, so the church okay. is still going on, but we're not there. And he is also a recording artist. So he did a lot of travel and ministry all over the world. And so I was home with the kids during that season. And I loved it. We homeschooled. We, yeah, it's crazy how even how that, the Lord made that happen because I was not even considering being a wife, a mom, or a homeschooler. So, like, those things were not even on my radar. <laughs> funny how the Lord does it but um so he's not a pastor now but he's um we're considering he's praying through what it looks like when he's done his PhD what'll be the next step oh Mm -hmm. so y'all have experienced a lot of different things in 22 years yes it's been a whirlwind (laughs) so how do how do you look back and see that God led you to this job and this opportunity that you have now it's very crazy. The thing I say all the time is that I feel like Joseph. Um, I did nothing to get this job. I wasn't lobbying for it, but the Lord orchestrated it. But I can see clearly the 16 years of me being home with my kids, we, I threw ridiculous parties and I learned how to run a business and I catered a million different events and I discipled as many women as I could. And I, um, was just creative and homeschooling and those types of things. And now in the job that I have, I see very clearly all these different skills and opportunities that I, all these things that I had just been acquiring over those 16 years, I'm just using them and I'm getting to grow in them more. And it's, it's incredible. It really is incredible how the Lord would take what felt like just obscurity, you know, just me and my crew and he's used it. It's it's been clearly laid out for me that the Lord, he had a plan that I just couldn't see. So did somebody just pluck you up and say, we want you here? And they you came to you? Yeah, it was crazy. I'm telling you, it was crazy. Um, I had, because I was working at the flower shop, I really had a sense of my kids were now in school. And I had a sense that there was something that the Lord wanted me to do, but I couldn't quite tell what it was. And so I was working, a friend of mine owns a flower shop and she's wonderful to work for and work with. So, and the ladies I was working with, it was a joy. So I got to go be creative there, but I kept feeling like, Lord, I feel like there's something more and I don't know quite what it is. You know, like this season when my kids ended and I don't know what to do next. So I um, came to the seminary and asked the lady in, in charge of women's life here. It's what it used to be called. 
Denise O'Donohue, she's a sweetheart. I asked her, I said, do you guys need any help with anything? And she said, I'll let you know if we ever do. And one day somebody went on maternity leave and they asked me to come and fill in as a receptionist. So I just sat in the back as a receptionist. But during that time, I, um, it was six weeks. And during those six weeks, I, I guess, I don't know, I was crazy. I'm <laughs> meeting with women in the back and it's like, <laughs> we're having prayer in the back and we're had discipleship and mentoring and now it's like 10 women and we're doing lunch together in the back and they were like oh you got a whole lot going on <laughs> <laughs> and so guy I work with now Jake he asked he actually hired me and said would you be able to plan events and I was sure I'll plan events um, I had done that mm-hmm. interestingly enough plenty of times to church and with my family with the kids and so I, he took a chance and allowed me to do that job. And what I know was the Lord is that in the process, the dean of students here noticed my passion for women and noticed just how I was drawing women into the office. Not me, but just me like, hey, meet me here. You know what I'm saying? That type of thing. And so he asked me if I'd be interested in being the assistant dean of students to women. And I had never I didn't even think I qualified for that position. <laughs> I was like, you know, it's like working at a flower shop. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, um, but he prayed about it and I, it didn't happen right away. And he offered me the position and I, it's been incredible. And then the director of graduate life happened. And so it's just, honestly, I feel like Joseph, I, sincerely. I was I, not in a pit because I mean, I was not just unhappy with my life, but I was certainly not seeing the vision for this I definitely was in a season that was kind of dry and I felt like I'm just not doing what you've given me to do and I don't know how to get there and so it was just interesting that there was interesting chain of events filling in for somebody on maternity leave that I got all the way up to where I am now it only took a year like it was just a one-year process but yeah (laughs) it's crazy y'all probably have some really good flower arrangements at your events yes we do (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> That's great. I love that. I'm I'm wondering when your kids were younger though, because you obviously have to have some gifts of leadership. Do you think? I do. I think, I think I was not aware though. I thought I was just doing what moms do. So um, I thought, you know, I'm mom, my husband travels. So he'd be gone uh, three weeks a month, you know, those types of things on tour he is also was a student at the time. So we had moved away from family. We lived in different cities while he went and finished his education at different places. So I felt like I'm just doing what moms do. You know, you get your little team together and you delegate and you teach people and you create leaders. And um, I have one son and I, I was determined that he was going to be a leader. I don't know why. Mm-hmm. I have a little mantra. They all had to say it. It's, today we're going to lead, serve, and represent Christ. And so we would say that every day as they were going out the door somewhere. And um, I think I just felt like I was just being a, a mom. And it wasn't until I had the opportunity to lead and I saw that I had vision for things and ideas and I was enjoying it, that it clicked mm-hmm. because I had leadership is a thing for me, but I had never considered that. Mm-hmm. Like my husband's world is so big and he is definitely a leader and I have never had a problem being in the background. So I thought that the part of me that was okay with being in the background meant I was not a leader. Um, I don't know why. So yeah. whenever your kids were young and you were at home, your husband was touring. Mm-hmm. Did you feel a sense of contentment in that? It, and, and if so, that's great. But did you also sometimes feel like there were passions or gifts that you had that were going unused in that time? Yes. Yes. I would be lying if I didn't say that, that I felt that because I wasn't the woman who grew up and just dreamed of being a mom. So I didn't necessarily feel automatic contentment in just being with them. I remember where I'm from, people are not stay at home moms. Like I don't come from a community where that's what people do. So when I even decided to be one, People would ask me, are you lazy? Do you just don't want to work? (laughs) Sincerely. And one of my children has special needs. And so we could see the value, obviously, of being home, especially after she was born. Um, But we were traveling. We were moving around so much. And my husband was going from project to project and school to school that it just didn't make sense, the financial investment of putting them all in school. So when I made that choice, I didn't even know what that meant. And I remember feeling like, I 
can't sit around and do nothing. So these are going to have to be the smartest kids anybody knows. And so <laughs> I have to prove that I'm doing something. And so I went hard on teaching them everything under the sun. But I would have this sense of, but who am I? Like, what, what, is, what does it mean to be Missy when there are no kids? And I struggled with that for a lot of years, particularly as my husband would get a degree and then another degree and then another degree. And we would be moving for his career and ministry opportunities. And I loved it. I was making a conscious choice to sacrifice certain things um, for their good and for our marriage and for our home. And so I did that willingly, but I couldn't help but wrestle through. But when they're grown and gone, what am I going to do? Because I'm devoting all my time here. If you could go back and speak to the younger you when you're at home with kids, I'm just thinking of women who are listening who are at home with kids mm-hmm. and they, they have embraced that. They are mm-hmm. serving their, their children and their family, just as what you said. What are some things that you would say to yourself in those younger years? I would definitely remind myself of God's sovereignty and his planning that we can't see the beginning from the end, but that he does not waste anything. And so all of the things that I'm, he's building in you and creating in you through your children, through the season, through the sacrifice, through the ah, craziness, um, mm-hmm. he is building something in you. And I, I think there are days when I was very discontent, but if I had focused on that, those days would have been much better well spent. Um, about a year ago, my husband got I had the opportunity to preach at our church and he was preaching on Jesus. So he was not talking about anybody in particular, but in the sermon, he was talking about how Jesus, we saw him to a certain point. He was about 12 and then he was gone and then he emerges ready to do ministry. And he was describing those years as the years of obscurity and how much was being built in Jesus's life in those years of, of obscurity. And it just resonated with me so much. And I told him afterwards, I said, sweetheart, you just spoke, preached a sermon to all the moms who are yes. at home with their kids in that audience. You just encouraged them that in those years that look like obscurity, the Lord Jesus is building muscles. And as we're memorizing scripture with the babies and as we're um, dying to ourselves daily and praying for people and serving people and leading women, and all those things that happening when no one sees those are our obscurity years and then god can allow us however it's different for every woman obviously but then after that we emerge prepared for ministry mm-hmm. in a new way mm-hmm. doesn't it seem like that this is the case more so for women than it is for men not that oh god, yeah god doesn't give them times of obscurity or times to grow but i think this is specific to women don't you yes i do I do. I, my, my husband, he, we got married and he hit the ground running and yeah. there was no pullback for the kids necessarily. And once, especially with the type of career that he had, like if you're going, you have to be going. And so, yeah, it is different. And, but the, I think what is beautiful about it being different is that it's different on purpose, that God has a plan, not as a second class thing and not by accident and not because you're less than, but because God has made a plan. And Just as women, we serve well, we lead well, we, um, some people argue that we don't multitask, but I feel like I don't know how my life would work if I didn't multitask. (laughs) I feel like we do multitask. Everyone we multitask. Yes, right. Um, We multitask and all of the parts of, of us that make us women and fit for the job of both mom and CEO is uniquely from God. And so I embrace it. I embrace the season. I embrace my womanhood in Christ. And yeah, I'm, I'm actually very grateful for the years of being at home with my kids, 16 years. I don't feel like it was a waste. Even though I couldn't see when, when that season ended, I could not see what it would be. But I now also have a 21 year old who's in college, who genuinely loves the Lord, who I get to have these gospel conversations with on a regular basis, who wants to devote his entire life to ministry. I'm like, okay, I'd do it again. Yes. I'd yeah. do it again. You know, I have a 20 year old who she's about to be 20 and she is on the cusp of deciding, like she said, I think I know what I want to do with my life. And she's studying the Bible and she's just a sweetheart and a joy to be around. And I'm like, Lord, none of this was a waste. My right. special needs baby is 
blossoming and just doing so well. So it's just, yeah, uh, I'm, I'm grateful for it now. Yes. Yes. So in the, I'm thinking especially about that year before you got this job, when mm-hmm. you were like, who am I apart yeah. from my kids and my husband, but yet you still didn't know yet what was going to happen at all. So, so you're kind of sitting in this time of uncertainty. How did you cultivate a trust in God in that time? Or there specific things that you remember <clears throat> doing that helped you to cultivate that trust? If I would be completely honest with you, um, I think I was up and down in that season. Yeah. I wasn't amazing. So I don't want to paint a picture <laughs> of me like just ever le- wearing out my knees in prayer, just waiting for the day someone hired me. That was not how it was. <laughs> um, there was. There were sad times when I just felt like I, ha- I have given it all away. I don't have anything left, Lord. What could you possibly do? And then there were seasons particularly at the flower shop when I would have the opportunity to have gospel conversations with people. And when I got to um, go with my husband to different events and just see the opportunity to minister to women that I would get glimpses of, okay, Lord, you can use me some kind of way. So I think I definitely had a couple women that I confided in and was just honest with, this is the season I'm in and I'm kind of down. I need you to pray for me. I need you to encourage me. And two of them in particular were very good at, I see you. I see the value in you, Missy. The Lord put something there. Continue to press forward diligently in where you are. And I'm grateful for those particular friends. I also, my mom, she has been telling me, I don't know, 15 years, <laughs> the Lord is going to use you, woman. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and she's been praying for me and challenging me and encouraging me. So I think just surrounding myself with godly women who would encourage me in that season, especially in my, when I was down, was super helpful. But also, I really, really was challenging myself on what it meant to be content. So, Lord, if you kept me in this flower shop for 10 years and women came to know the Lord and I served my community and I served my family, is that okay? And the answer is yes. Could I be content with this? And if that's where he put me for 10 years, then I need to be okay with that. And so I think I really had to check myself and do a lot of challenging on what it is that actually makes me content in Christ. And it can't be the job, right? Right. That's what I was thinking is a lot of times I think we think a role or a job is the answer, but in reality, we can minister and serve just in life, just going about life and interacting with people. And that's sometimes hard for me because I am I'm an achiever. I want to I lead. I want to do these things. I have all these ideas. Mm-hmm. And sometimes when God kind of holds me back, I don't like it because I, I right. need, I'm looking for that validation almost of mm-hmm. who I am. And that's when he reminds me the the best lessons are learned in the obscurity. You don't yes. have anything to say unless you've been in the obscurity. Yes. Yes. It's like working out. You don't do one workout and then you have muscles, right? You got to keep working at it. And it's in those five o'clock in the morning workouts, not the day you get to show yourself off at the beach, right? All of the real effort came in when you did (laughs) it in the shower when everybody else was eating pizza. (laughs) First of all, I don't like to show, I don't ever think, I can't wait to show myself off at the beach. Oh, girl, we're at the same place. But you know, that's what everybody can relate to that. (laughs) I do no showing off at the beach, but... (laughs) But we get the point. Right. You got my point. But, but you know what I'm saying? Like all of those muscles get built somewhere else well before you're able to flex them. Mm -hmm. And I had to be reminded of, I think it's been my mantra. My kids, I'll say it endlessly. The Lord doesn't waste his time. And so if it takes 10 years in a place to get you to be ready for what he has, then you need to be, figure out what it is he wants you to learn in those 10 years. Mm -hmm. And if it takes you, some people three years and like whatever it is, whatever that season is, embrace it and learn the lesson and be prepared then for the next season. I, I see now, like I look back, like oh, <laughs> I can't even believe I wasted so much time. And to be honest, 16 years flew by. Yes. So how can women who are listening, who are in that stage of uncertainty, what are, how can they cultivate their gifts, even though they're in the place of obscurity. What are some things that you would encourage them to do? First of all, I would encourage them to be, to use their time wisely, right? To not allow their days just to carry them away. And so that they're not redeeming the time. 
I would encourage them to be readers of God's word, to know God's word, because the Lord is going to speak clearly to them through his word. Um, to also find out about themselves, you know, taking personality tests, um, seeing which one of your children's personality, she is just like me. And I can see she is, I've learned a lot about myself through watching my children develop. Mm -hmm. And um, once you begin to learn about yourself, you can see the areas in which you serve. I tell all of the women that I work with and for and who come to me, you have a sphere of influence. How you're using it is up to you. So you need to figure out what is your sphere of influence, whether it be moms at the playground, whether it's in your community, whether it's at your children's school, and then begin to use your personal gifts and skills in your area of influence. Some, and not everyone's a leader. Like me and you, I know when you said you're an achiever, I'm like, I can relate. That's not everyone, but God has given you something and you're responsible for using it even in the years when your children are little. This doesn't get to be checkout year. And I think sometimes we give ourselves a pass to use these years to check out and only want to talk about peanut butter jelly sandwiches and Johnny's t-ball class. And you know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. But really, we need to be running hard after Jesus in this season, especially as a mom whose children are in this side of life, the things they're bombarded with. If I'm not prepared, I will not be prepared to help them. That's right. If I don't know God's word, I can't give them God's word. And so, yeah, our children are being raised in a space that's crazy. Mm -hmm. And so if we have nothing for them because we spent those years, these years checked out, we're no good to them when they're older. Mm -hmm. Well, and they see you modeling service and, yes. and using who you are and how God has made you and using that for his glory. Sometimes I feel guilty. So, you know, I think, oh, this is taken away from my kids. But when I really think about it, what I feel like it's taken away from is me being centered on them. Yeah. Like they're because when they become your idols. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so it's, it's not so bad. It's not a bad thing for me to say, oh, it's not going to be about them. Of course, I'm going to care for them and be engaged as a mom. I'm not saying that, but I'm saying, if I'm not using my gifts because I'm worried about the time it's going to take away from them, I'm really doing everybody a disservice. Right. Right. You know, we used our home as a, as ministry all the time. We always had people over and it was intentional. It wasn't just come and hang out and watch TV. And we would teach even the kids little things. We had a little code and I guess anybody who's been at our house who's heard it now will know what I meant, but we would, I would always tell the kids, Especially if people just dropped in, I'd say, guys, this meal is a bag meal. And a bag is just B-A-G. And I would always tell them that meant branches after the guests. So we're going to take the time to serve our guests. This is your opportunity to do ministry. You guys, we're going to let the guests eat. We're going to let the guests get full. And the branches will go after them. And every once in a while, you're here grumbling. But I would hear them encouraging each other. Look, this is, we get to do ministry. We get to serve. We get to, you know what I'm saying? We would... I would tell them if we went into any space, it would have to be better when we left. So, you know what I'm saying? Opportunities to encourage them that it wasn't even just my responsibility to do ministry, but as a family, we had a responsibility mm -hmm. to do ministry mm -hmm. and them to find their ways to lead. Well, yeah, I'd love to know more about that. And mm -hmm. How have you helped your children discover their own gifts that God has given them? And how have you taught them how to serve other people? My son in particular, I remember telling him when he was four, I said, sweetie, you may never know. Well, not you may never know, but you won't know for a while specifically what God has called you to, but you're the oldest. And so God has called you to be the older brother. And that is a role and you should lead with excellence. You need to be an excellent older brother. You should care about what they think, what happens to your sisters. And he took that very seriously. He felt like that was unleashing a role like, like this thing for him. But then I have three girls, and so each one of them, I would give them a role. Like, Trinity, you are the oldest girl. God has placed you in that role. That is something that is yours forever. And so through that, I could see how they would walk out that leadership or that role. And my son is very passionate about it. He is not afraid to share the gospel. He, but he's also an introvert, so it's interesting. But once you get him on this track. And so learning each one of their personality style, styles, I could understand how to serve, send them off. One of my baby girls is an artist and very, very loyal. So her job was to make everybody's birthday cards. Her job is to 
um, create space where somebody comes over and it's their birthday, this is how we celebrate you. One of them, she likes to um, sing. So she like, listen, you are in charge of the birthday song every time and you're in charge, you know what I'm saying? But just mm-hmm. finding little ways for them to feel responsible and all of the things that we did to serve people. And they took it and ran and we planted a church. They were devastated that they didn't have like official roles. <laughs> <laughs> That's the pastor. What am I? <laughs> yep. That's great. Yeah, so, yeah, it was really great. So we even found ways to give them opportunities to serve. You can be a little ambassador. You can be, uh, you can be a greeter, you know. And I think now they only know having, even my girl, and that's important, they only know having had opportunities to lead mm. and to serve. That's what they know. They know that I've, I have been required to be actively leading and serving. Mm. Why do you say that specifically about your girls? Because I think there are, we can sometimes squelch that in our girls Yeah. because, you know, we want to elevate that in our boys. And then, so we don't remember that it's valuable in both. Um, When our girls go to school, they don't go to school and hear girl math and girl physics and girl science. They're going to learn like everyone else. They need to know how to stand up for themselves. They need to know how to respect both themselves and the people around them. And those are things that have to be taught just like the boys. And so I can have a separate set in that regard in our house. Like my son was doing dishes and taking out the trash and the girls were doing dishes and taking out the trash. And so, Mm -hmm. Are you seeing in the seminary uh, or just maybe not necessarily, I guess, Southeastern, but that's, that's who you're interacting with. Are you seeing in women that they do doubt their abilities? to leave. Yes. yes. I do think um, they either feel like they shouldn't be doing it because that's in some way biblical to lead is not like women shouldn't be doing it. Or they feel like they are going to be wanting to take over everything. So they prefer to fall back and not be perceived incorrectly. Right. And so for me, I'm constantly pushing them to a remember God's call. I, the thing that I'm careful about is even with my girls your brother has to be respected your brother god has given him a call as a man this is the way in which you relate to him and the way he'll relate to you um but none of that negates my requirement for the females for the girls it doesn't (laughs) right right we're going to stand before the lord for you and what did you do you did you sit back and do nothing because you thought you were supposed to do nothing there's that's not biblical and so in this space when i run into those women i challenge them likewise Mm, that's really good. We're aware of what you cannot do. Are you aware of what you can do? Mm, yes. And what you're responsible to be doing. Yes. I, I whether a woman has a gift of leadership or 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 not, I think we all doubt our gifts at times. And yes. I've heard you say that you really like to. It seems like you're very passionate about calling women up into leadership and yes. service. So why is that so important to you? I think I think there was. First of all, I think I've fallen in love with watching people who are perceived as invisible be visible. I'm the person who the children who no one re- remembers are the children I would remember all the time. And the people from depressed communities are the people I want to go see and serve. And women who are not living up to their potential are the women I want to push forward. And I think it's because God has given all of us voice. And some, sometimes we only get to hear the top 10 voices all the time. Yeah, <laughs> and I feel like true. God's kingdom is too big and too vast and too important to only hear a certain amount of voices all the time. So those invisible, those voiceless, those silent people are the ones I want to push forward. Because I'm like, God did not create you to sit in a room by yourself and do nothing. He created you for a purpose. So let's help you run in it. Mm-hmm. And it's beautiful to watch women go from one space in Christ to another one. And not always in leadership, but certainly in service. It's beautiful to watch. And I I don't know, I get excited by it. Mm -hmm. So how do you practice doing that? Teach us how we can do that in other women's lives. Um, One of the things we have to be careful about is to not be threatened by other women, right? So a woman who can do things better than me is exciting because now I get to learn, right? Mm -hmm. And I think that that's one of the things when you get over yourself, and you get over whatever are your weaknesses and whatever, when you get over that, you realize that all of the women around you are an opportunity either to learn 
or for you to shrink back. And so I've just gotten over the, she's better at me at this than me, so I'm going to not. So because of that, I've had the opportunity to be in situations where I thought I'm here just to learn. And yet I didn't realize that I was pouring something into them as well. Mm -hmm. And in those opportunities to pour out, I realized how much I love that. Yeah. So I love having women that I can pour into. I love being around women who are willing to share and pour into me. And I'm intentional to uh, something about finding out what people's strengths are and wanting to give them the opportunity to do it. So, I mean, listen, if I find out a woman here can draw a little bit, I'm like, hey, can you draw something for the next event? Like, <laughs> Yeah, I give her that opportunity. There's a mom here. She made spice cider. I was like, that's the best cider I've ever had. Can we use that for all of our things? You know what I'm mean? saying? Yes. Because I think the moment we begin to push women forward or people forward, the moment we begin to push people forward in their skills, our minds will be blown, A, by what they can do and what the Lord has allowed you to unlock in them. And then the community that you create around you is incredible when you're like I know people that can do just about everything yeah because I had a conversation and I just said to her yeah we'll go do it yes <laughs> I can empower people I, I love it I do yeah I, I love doing that as well and I think most people we think that that others already know what their gifts are they already know what they're gonna but really in reality we none of us really are sure until right. somebody else kind of confirms that in us or says it and we had no idea we'd never considered right. that that could be something that could be used to edify the church or bless other people so i yeah. i love that as well yeah those of us who are visionaries should be willing to share that vision with people who may not have it even for their own lives you know, we do that for our kids. Oh, you'd make a great lawyer. Oh, you'd make a great doctor. So we should be doing that for our community, you know? Yeah. What are you most encouraged about with the work that you're doing? Honestly, I come to work every day excited to come to work. So I mean, there's a lot of things, but honestly, the impact I'm having on women, I don't do, I say this to my team all the time. We don't do events, just to do events. We don't do trainings just to say we get a training. We're not doing this just for funding. We're not doing this just... Sincerely, I want to finish well. And I believe when I stand before the Lord, I want him to be able to see all of the people that I've put my hand on and want to make better solely for his glory. Solely, honestly, to hide, hide Missy, it's really not about me, but genuinely to see the kingdom be advanced and God be glorified in the lives of people. And so I get to do that all the time. I get to have conversations and push people towards their their calling towards their dreams toward I, I get to pray with people and cry with the ladies and <laughs> and encourage and challenge I'm I have no problem challenging people girl that's wrong you look a mess fix that you know? <laughs> <laughs> that's good fix that and so but because those same people are to be the people who I will be their champion and so I think I'm like, well, I can champion and challenge. And so, uh, yeah, honestly, I, I love coming to work and having the opportunity to touch people's lives, but for the gospel, for the sake of the gospel. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, you're in the right place if you are excited amen. to go to work. Yes, and, uh, amen. <laughs> and I am so thankful for what you're doing at Southeastern. And thank you, thank you for, for your time today. I've really enjoyed getting to talk with you. Absolutely. This has been great. I'm grateful for what you're doing. You're a blessing and it's great to get the opportunity to be a part of this. Well, thank you. I hope you loved listening to that conversation with Missy as much as I loved having it. There will be many more like this conversation over the course of this season. You are going to hear from artists, leaders, teachers, writers, bridge builders, disciplers, businesswomen, and many others. Friends, now is a perfect time for you to invite others to jump in and learn with you about serving by faith. So here's what I'd love for you to do. Please share this podcast episode with one or two friends right now, or even better, post about it on social media and invite folks to come along with us this season. Join me next week as I speak with author Jared Wilson about what spiritual gifts actually are and how we know we're serving by the Spirit rather than in our own strength and how we know when God is calling us to leave or release where we're currently serving. He brings a needed pastoral perspective to our conversation that's really helpful. Until then, friends, have a great week and keep walking forward by faith.